Hello everyone, this is The Commander, and in today's video, I'm going to review Jedi Survivor. The sequel to Jedi Fallen Order it came out um, early in 2023, I think around screen time, but I was just able to get the game a month or so ago, and now I have fully played the entire story and I've even done a lot of exploration and completion after the main story, so I think I have enough information to talk about the game, give you my thoughts on it. I will open this with a spoiler-free section, and then I'll get into the story deep and talk all about the story and other spoiler parts of this game. So, if you have not uh, played the game yet, I advise... Uh, clicking off when I get to that part. So, starting with the spoiler-free section, we're going to talk about some more cosmetic things, like graphics. So, the graphics for Jedi Fallen Order were very, very good, especially for its time. Um, Jedi Fallen Order was not a next-gen game yet, but it still had really good graphics, and they have just gone uh, above and beyond here for Jedi Survivor with uh, next-gen console graphics, and there are times where the game could probably fool you for, um, like, a movie at times, and they do really, really good with the graphics in this game, and there's some beautiful spots in the planets, and then the cutscenes are very movie-like as well. So graphics is a big success of Jedi Survivor. Another success in comparison to Jedi Fallen Order is navigation. So in Jedi Fallen Order, there are some infamous problems um, regarding navigation and the in-game map and how you get around. So this uh, stemmed from the planet Zepho in Jedi Fallen Order. That was just a really intricate map and it was very difficult to get around and if you went all the way down to the tombs or other parts obscured from the landing pad you had to manually go all the way back to the landing pad to go to another planet because there's no fast travel of any kind in that game there may be some elevators, but other than that, nothing really to get around fast, and you had to just navigate. And yes, the absence of fast travel was a problem for Jedi Fallen Order, but even the map itself could be hard to read at times, and it, like, for Zepho, there are some blurry parts of the map, uh, because I just looked at that a few weeks ago, and it was definitely a lot harder to read than the maps for Jedi Survivor. So Jedi Survivor improves on this with fast travel between meditation points, which is amazing, so nice to have. You don't have to worry about navigation that much in the game at all, unless you're doing 100% completion. And even with 100% completion attempts, you have animals that you can use to get from one place to another in a quicker manner. And then you also have map upgrades that can be found throughout the game. And that means that you can know all the collectibles and where they are. But you do have to do some challenges to get to those. So, navigation greatly improved. It could be improved more the next game. Um, by just, I guess, adding more of those collectibles on there. You can see all of them, but maybe adding that a little bit earlier in the game because it's a pretty obscure thing to find. And maybe made, making the, you know, when you put in a, an objective and it sends you to it, maybe instead of just having that on the map, they could add that into the real game. Um, instead of just the map, I think that would make navigation a lot better. But overall, they had huge improvement with navigation for this game. Another huge improvement category for Jedi Survivor is customization. There were some customization options for Jedi Fallen Order, and they're pretty good. Like, when I played Jedi Fallen Order, I was impressed by the customization options. Um, there's a 
good number of outfits for Cal, um, some skins for BD, and some skins for the Mantis, and that's the only thing that does not carry over to Survivor, uh, skins for the Mantis, it's just the same color every time, so that's a bit disappointing, but it's not that much of a loss when you get so many outfits for Cal, you get all these jackets and everything, um, almost endless, you get pants, jackets, all that kind of stuff, you can customize Cal's hair, his facial hair, everything pretty much about him, except for, like, his key features, but the customization for Cal is really good. BD1 also has a lot more customization options. Uh, they added all kinds of, you can switch out the style for each of his body parts. Um, you can change the color of every part of his body, pretty much, and... The, the same thing carries over for lightsabers and uh, blasters. So there are just endless amounts of customization in this game. And I hope they continue to expand on it in the next one. Uh, so yeah, customization a huge success of Survivor. You can also pick your stance for lightsabers. So you can have cross star, dual wield, double blade, bladed uh, blaster and single bladed so a lot of options there it would be cool if they added in even more options like quadruple bladed in the next one i just think that'd be pretty cool um and i don't think they there's really such a thing as too much customization as long as you're keeping cal as the main character so now let's go into planets, and this is without spoilers. So I will say that there are six planets in this game. There are seven in Jedi Fallen Order, but not all of them were traversable at all times there. You get six planets here. Four, you get two small planets. Four small to medium. Two, two small planets, two small to medium planets, and and two big planets, pretty much, with Kobo being the open world planet. It is massive. It is probably twice the size of the biggest planet in Jedi Fallen Order, which I would probably say is Zepho. So, definitely fewer medium-sized planets in this game, but you do get Kobo, which is massive. So, I think they did all right with the planets for this game. I'll get more into them into the spoiler review, and I'm actually gonna have a video coming out soon talking about the size of each planet in the game. Um, but Kobo's cool, but it kind of dominates a little too much for my liking, but again, I'll talk more about that in that other video. And regarding the storyline, I can't talk about it too much here, but it takes place a few years after Jedi Fallen Order. I think there's a book to fill in that gap, so it's interesting that they did that, and it'll be interesting to see what they do going forward, but I'm not really going to get into the storyline too much here. I'm going to wait a little longer until we get to the spoiler review. The last part of the spoiler-free review I have is is the music for the game. It's a uh, very good music and it really contributes to the the feelings that you get with each planet and some great character themes in the game. So that is going to do it for the spoiler free review. So if you do not want to get spoiled, if you haven't played the game, I'm going to head into the spoiler review right now. So we're going to start things off right away with the storyline and also looking at how each planet plays into the storyline of the game. We're not going to get to the exploration part of the game yet. We are just looking at the main story. So you start off on Coruscant where you are basically like imprisoned by the Coruscant security force, but they're actually your friends and you learn all this stuff out very early early in the game and Coruscant they made it seem like it was gonna be like the focal point of the game with the trailers but it definitely was not 
the uh, the senator there, the pound senator, he is briefly in the game. He seems to be killed by the ninth sister who shows up. Obviously, she was in Jedi Fallen Order and is back here for revenge against Cal because Cal cut off her hand. And Cal is able to fight her pretty easily, and she is killed. So Cal definitely has improved a lot in his skills from the first first part of the game to now and that was pretty exciting to see there isn't too much gameplay on Coruscant you can go back to Coruscant unlike say Braca from Fallen Order but there's not too much gameplay on Coruscant a lot of cutscenes in it it feels like a movie at first more so than any time in Fallen Order, there I feel like there are more cutscenes and it just feels more story driven, at least for the story part of the game. That completely changes after you complete the story mode. So then you go to Kobo with uh, Bode, who you've picked up from the Coruscant Security Force, and you crash land there. And the soon the main antagonist, I would say, for at least the first half of this story is revealed, and that is the Bedlam Raiders. So the Bedlam Raiders are led by Ravis and Dagon Gera, and they use uh, the Separate Destroyed, which was, it was pretty interesting to see them and fun to fight against them. And... So it's a new faction of the as the villain for this game, which is of course a new path because with other games like Fallen Order, the Empire was the main enemy. But that is not the case in this game. Now to say even after you beat the game, the Bedlam Raiders are more of the enemy than the Empire just because they're more prevalent on Kobo. There is a lot of them across the planet. And I think they're an, they're an okay uh, army to go against. I think it's a pretty good choice to have a non-imperial villain. So we're, it's something else before we do more Empire in the next game. Because I do think this will be a trilogy. So on Kobo, you find uh, the... I, I'm Rambler to Reach, I think it is, the outpost where Pylon Saloon is, and this is the part that really makes it feel like an open world game. You have all of these shops you can go to, um, you've got the garden up on the top, you have probably about 10 characters in the saloon that you can talk to, and, you know, fish tanks and all kinds of stuff you can buy there, and it really does feel open world. It is an improvement to the last game, which felt really isolating. There wasn't many characters. It felt a little bit dead regarding the other characters. And then they've got, you've got this, which is definitely more of that open world feel. And there's probably about 15 to 20 characters that you can interact with. And some they did very well with the creation of each of those characters and their, their entertaining um, NPCs. So, then we go to another planet, Jedha. This obviously is from Rogue One. It's a another desert planet, a lot of those in Star Wars. And the Bellum Raiders are not here, it's just the Imperials. And this is where some of the characters, characters from last game have made their base with the Narcus Anchorite there. And we have Seer and Eno Cordova, who was kind of just a hologram guide figure in the last game, we found out is alive. So that was certainly a bit of a surprise to see him there. And it, if you told me to tell you exactly what how the story goes in like sequential order it'd be a little hard i could tell you like the planets you do go back and forth from kobo to jeddah to the shadowed moon a lot um but the story really is t it takes off by going to the forest array in kobo where you find dagon gera this uh jedi from the high republic era and 
he has now kind of turned into a dark Jedi. I don't think I would call him a Sith, but because he's angry with his master and the other Jedi for not letting him go to this hidden planet Tantalor that you're in search of. And that's kind of the main plot. You're in search of Tantalor, this hidden pla planet, a refuge, and it's all High Republic themed, kind of. And you've got the Bedlam Raiders led by Ravis and Dagon as your main enemy. So, from that point to kind of like the middle part of the story, you're just doing a lot of searching for different items. Um, it's definitely led by the navigation you have. It kind of tells you where to go on the map, so it doesn't feel too independent like it does after the game. Um, but it's also not, there's not too many, like, cutscenes necessarily in this part. And you have, um, so you're just going from planet to planet and trying to find all these MacGuffins that kind of keep the story propelling. It's like you got to find this to go to here, and then you got to find this to go to here. And to be honest, it is a little bit forgettable just because there's no major events. Now, you do have some good stuff happening inter-character-wise. Um, Cal and Marin get together, and that was probably the best part of the story mode, or at least this section of it. Um, it was really, really interesting to see them uh, getting together on Jedha. That was a really fun part. So you do all these kind of missions to get these items that you need to eventually get to Tantalor. Um Another planet, the Shattered Moon, it's a medium, small-sized planet, not too big, and it's decent. It's a lot of that High Republic, like, material that um, kind of gives it that High Republic feel. Not that interesting of a planet, because there's not really any nature of it. And so then the story really takes off when you go back to Jeddah. I think it was... I forget exactly where the mission is on Jeddah, but you go back to Jeddah, and everything changes. The characters think everything's going well. They're, they're talking about how they're going to set up a future on Tantalor, but then you find out that Bode, your friend, he, he has become a very trusted character by this point. He gives you a blaster, and he's like, I genuinely genuinely thought that Bode was a good character by this point and did not see his turn to the dark side coming. And so they did a very, very good job with that. And he goes right away by killing Eno Cordova. And um, so that was very interesting to see. And then you learn that Bode is not just a, uh, a spy for the Empire, but he is also a dark Jedi. Once again, I wouldn't call him a Sith necessarily, but he was a Jedi during the Purge, turned to the dark side, which I feel like th th this story has been turned, t uh, told like 10,000 times, a Jedi during the Purge turned to the dark side, I'm mean, like, how many different characters can they just create that were Jedi during the Purge and turned to the dark side, I feel like they are wearing that away a little much, but I do like Bode's character arc, I think it's pretty cool, and so then you have to fight him, and you fail, and then you get to be Seer for the first time, which obviously that's a little, you know, suspicious, and... So then you ha because this is the first time you've been here and so then the Empire is seizing against Jeddah and you have to protect the base but things aren't going well and eventually you get to a fight between Seer and Vader who just shows up shows up again. Now I do have a little bit of a problem with this and that's that why is Vader everywhere? It's like he can't be everywhere at once. There's got to be some kind of other villain we can use. Is the Grand Inquisitor around at this point? Do we have Thrawn? It's like, there needs to be someone else. Because, obviously, C and Cal are pretty powerful at this point. But, they're not powerful enough to warrant Vader, in my opinion. So, it was definitely interesting to see Vader around at Jeddah this time.
So then we get a nice big battle between Seer and Vader, and it's a great battle. Um, some people have said that Seer puts up too good of a fight. I don't think so. I know Vader is powerful and all, but is he the most powerful character in Star Wars? It's very debatable. There's not necessarily a clear power than maybe Yoda, Palpatine, they at the top, or are Anakin and Luke just as good as them. It's kind of hard to tell. So I think it's, it's fine. You know, it creates some excitement. This is probably the best part of the story mode, or at least the most exciting part of it. And eventually, yes, Seer does die, and it's a very sad moment, and it's very well done for all this stuff to be in a video game. I think they did a great job with the story for this game. So then you, after that, you have to chase after Bo, who goes to the ISB base on Nova Garon, and you learn that he is working with the security bur bureau to kind of just... You know, he really, he was being hunted, and then, so he just went to the Empire to kind of stay safe and keep his daughter safe, and he wants to find a new home on Tantalor to escape all of it. And that, be, this shows how much I forgot the middle part of the game. I completely forgot about how Cal killed Ravis and Dagon Gera. I, it just, those characters, they're okay, I mean... But they kind of just, I forgot that they died because it wasn't all that important to the story. Um, so that was another part of the story. Cal killing uh, Dagon and Ravis. And this just shows Cal's power pretty much um, more than anything else. So then Cal hunt, hunts down Bode and then eventually using um, a... A control center on Kobo, Cal, and the gain, what's left of them at least, go to Tantalor, where Cal fights, um, fights Bode, um, for one last time. And what was interesting about this fight is that Cal was fighting alongside Marin, so it was cool to see Marin really getting um, some fighting experience, and I think she is one of the best characters to come out of this game, and they were able to take down and kill Bode, and it is a bit of a sad moment because Tada, Bode's daughter, is there, and it is a very interesting end to the story. And so that's pretty much it. I'm going to go over all the characters now and the planet. So we talked about Kobo. It's a large open world planet. And it, it's good. There's a lot of areas on Kobo that are very different. But the large majority of it, you could probably confuse different places. And so yeah, it's just a very big planet. Um, too big. I think so. I would have preferred to see another large planet in addition to Kobo and Jeddah. Jeddah, you know, it's not as diverse a, uh, that, as Kobo is. It's just a desert planet. I haven't been to it m as much after the game, but I don't think it's quite as interesting. The Shattered Moon, it's time just a small to medium-sized planet. Uh, Nova Garon is really just the Imperial base there. Nothing too interesting there. But in the story, it, another interesting moment occurs there when Kel is tempted by the dark side, and that kind of is an interesting new part of his character arc, and we'll see how that gets set in the third game of the series and then you have Tantalor which is where it's what the entire plot is leading to and it's pretty but there's not much of anything at all on it. there's like four collectibles three named areas it's like very very small and there just doesn't seem to be a point of it yet maybe there will be in the next game so looking at each character and how they uh, fared throughout the storyline of this. Cal, I, I really got to like Cal a lot more in this game. Um, in the last game, he felt he didn't feel that much that fleshed out. 
as a character, but now he's gotten much stronger. Um, he's not necessarily a typical Jedi. He's gotten very aggressive, tempted by the dark side even a little bit. He's got a relationship with Marin. So I think Cal is definitely a more interesting character now. Um, Looking at his droid BD-1, BD-1 was much more of a pivotal character in the first game. There were more scenes with him, and we did not get to see him in action as much, even though he's still with Cal all the time. Grease, the pilot of the Mantis, a comic relief character, he, he is a really fun character and continued from last game. Marin, I've already talked about her a little bit, she is a really cool character being a night sister in a relationship with a Jedi. And yeah, so that was really interesting to see. And then Seer, we didn't get to see too much of Seer in this game, unfortunately, before she died. Um, but it is she serves as, as a source of grief, grief for a uh, Cal to go through. Um, but we didn't really get to see too much of her in this game. And then Bode, I think they did wonderful with that character. Uh, he turned out to be pretty powerful at the end, but not as powerful as Cal. Um, but a really cool arc with him turning to the dark side. I enjoyed that one for sure. He was definitely the best villain of the game. Because Dagon, he just was an old Republic, High Republic. And he just wasn't that interesting, and Ravis wasn't that interesting either. Um, and then looking at, they brought Eno Cordova into the game, and then he didn't really serve much of a purpose, so that was definitely a bit disappointing. If he could have maybe provided some more wisdom because he's an old, old older Jedi, that would have made more interesting uh, for the plot of the game. And then two more High Republic people, uh, Z, it's the droid from the High Republic that you rescue, and then Santari Kree is the master of Dagon, and you hear a lot of echoes and stuff from her. So I do think they did really, really good with this game. I know I had a few complaints about the storyline and the characters, but these are pretty minor. Don't don't take them as full complaints from me. They're just a little nitpick, a few, a few nitpicks that I had. Um, I think they definitely improved on the uh, Fallen Order in almost all respects. I do you think I actually enjoy the story for this game more than Fallen Order still, despite my complaints with it? And did a lot of great character development in this game. So I'm going to give this game a 10 out of 10. Um, that is unprecedented territory. Um, this is the best uh, Star Wars game that I've played at least. And it's honestly better than most of the Star Wars series and movies that they produce nowadays. So, the team did a really great job with Jedi Survivor, and I'm just so excited for the third installment of the series and hope they can keep doing better. So, yeah, it was a very good game. Thank you for watching, and this is The Commander signing out.